Hey everyone, welcome back to the workshop. As most of you will know, I've used this little mini lathe for over two years now, and whilst it's not perfect, these machines can produce some really good parts. One area that really limits them though, is the rigidity of the lathe. And whilst I personally believe these concerns can be a little bit overblown at times, it is true that they lack the mass and rigidity compared to a full size lathe. That's not to say we can't improve what we have here. From using the lathe, I've narrowed down the list to five key areas where rigidity tends to be lost. The first area we need to address is the spindle bearings. They have two really critical jobs in a lathe. They need to hold and allow the spindle to rotate concentrically, and they need to resist loads generated by turning. As I've demonstrated in the past, the concentricness is still really good after two years. It still registers under 10 microns but the bearing's ability to resist cutting loads has declined over time. Pushing on it, we can see about 50 microns of movement from just my body weight. And also by the looks of things, the lathe mountings could use a little bit of bracing. So to replace the spindle bearings, we will need to disassemble the lathe and remove the spindle housing too. Most mini lathes come apart virtually the same way. Disconnect the power, remove the lead screw and the control box and wiring. The electricals and wiring tend to vary between brands and models, so I recommend taking several photos to help you put it back together. The spindle housing is usually bolted to the bed using two hex socket screws on the front of the lathe and a hex headed bolt above where the motor is mounted. Depending on the model of lathe, you may also need to remove a gearbox located inside the spindle housing. It's usually just a shaft held in some bearings by a few circlips and it's very easy to push out. From what I've observed, these types of geared models are a lot less common nowadays. Now at times like this, having a press and a bearing puller would be really helpful, but if you're like me and don't own one, placing the spindle housing between two vice jaws and hammering the end with a hammer and a piece of wood will do a fine job of removing the spindle and bearings. Once we're done, we should have a spindle and a housing with no bearings on them. As standard, these lathes come with a pair of 6206 ball bearings that really aren't designed to handle the loads generated by turning, hence the play and movement that we saw beforehand. Now optimally, we replace them with a set of 7206 angular contact bearings. They're sealed and they work really well at high RPM. However, the going cost for a set of angular contact bearings was about $90 each plus shipping, so I did what most people do and opt for a set of tapered roller bearings. These are 3206 tapered roller bearings and they were about $20 each. They're commonly used on lathes and stand up to the cutting forces really well, with the only downside here is they aren't sealed and they will need periodic greasing. Now normally, you'd want to place the bearings out a ring in a freezer to shrink it, so the installation is a little bit easier, but I was in a bit of a hurry to get the lathe back together, and I forgot. However, it was installed without much issue. Before installing the rollers, you'll want to pack the rollers very lightly with grease. I had some King Chrome bearing grease on hand, and you'll want just enough to get the rollers covered and lubricated. One thing we'll need to account for is that the bearings are slightly wider than the stock ones, in total about 3mm. As a result, we'll need to reduce the length of this spacer by about the same amount. I recommend that you do this before you disassemble the lathe, but thankfully I had the Sherline so I could do it with the lathe disassembled. As a final step, we'll need to add some preload to the assembly using the nut to push the bearings into their tapered rings. This will reduce runout and improve rigidity. In my experience, there is a small margin for finding the correct amount of preload. Too little and there will be end-to-end -end play, run out and wobble. Too much however and the spindle will refuse to spin. Finding the correct amount of preload can be a little bit difficult. I ran in the bearings at a few hundred RPM for about 5-10 to 10 minutes with some preload. And then I adjusted the preload accordingly. And eventually, you will find the sweet spot. Testing the new bearings showed an improvement to the run out. It was already pretty good, but now it is certainly slightly better. Applying a load to the spindle shows a dramatic reduction in play and flex, and a quick test shows that the surface finish has dramatically improved too. 
The carbide insert is a little bit worn, but I'm very impressed with the results. With the bearings changed, we can now turn our attention to the carriage, which is where most of the laser rigidity is lost. Upgrading the gib strips has been a big priority for quite some time now. The stock ones tend to be very poorly made and are often bent. They're also undersized and have a tendency to roll, reducing the contact area of the gib strip. Using the mill, I made a replacement gib using some brass stock. I super glued the brass to a steel arbor to cut it to the correct height. I then used a makeshift inverse dovetail cutter to cut the correct angle into the gib strip. It was my first time using the cutter, so finding the correct speeds and feeds in situ proved to be a bit of a challenge. I eventually found a speed and feed that the cutter was happy with, and the surface finish turned out to be pretty decent. Using a small needle file, I filed a small chamfer into the ends to help it install more easily. Unlike the stock gib, the new brass one makes full contact with each surface of the dovetail and it has less of a tendency to roll, unlike the old one, and the brass material makes for a very smooth action. Leading into area 3, we need to make sure that the correct amount of pressure is applied to the gib strip using the grub screws. This is very critical, even with the stock gibs. You want to add enough pressure so that the cross slide can't rotate under pressure, but not too much so that the cross slide seizes up. For a new lathe, adjusting the grub screws is an easy way to improve the machine as they are usually pretty poorly adjusted at the factory. Another key upgrade is to replace the carriage retainer strips. I really criticise this lathe harshly, but this is one of the poorer bits of design. The retainer strips are designed to hold the carriage onto the wags, and the strips need to be adjusted so that they are parallel to the underside of the wags. To adjust the height of the strip, two threaded grub screws are adjusted to push the strip away from the carriage whilst three socket head screws fasten the strip in place. As a result, adjusting it is a very difficult process and it's very difficult to get it done correctly. Normally the strips will sit at an angle and that's what's happened here. As we can see, there's a wear line caused by rubbing along the bed with the strip at an angle. This method also usually results in the plates bending due to the force of the outside screws pushing upwards. And since the strips are made from cast iron, this will usually end up with the strips actually cracking under load. The upgrade is pretty straightforward. We'll take a piece of 25 by 5 mild steel and cut it down so it's 20 by 5 by 100. The mild steel is less hard than the cast iron and should wear a lot less than the cast iron strips. Though I'm sure using brass would be the better alternative. The steel was super glued to an aluminium arbor and a 0.7mm strip was cut. I measured that the height difference between the carriage and the bed was 0.8mm, so by cutting the slot undersized, I could use shim stock to get it perfectly leveled and parallel. The final job was to drill the holes for the screws. And I gotta say, it is a big improvement. The plates have been a big issue for a very long time, and it feels so much more rigid than before. The final upgrade is one that won't be permanent, but replacing the compound for a solid tool post will add a lot of rigidity, as the compound is where a lot of rigidity is lost. And considering that I go weeks without needing to cut tapers, replacing it is a no-brainer. The solid tool post will be a 40mm tall piece of aluminium that needs to be milled flat, and holes drilled in it so it can mount the rotating plate on the cross slide.
To give the lathe that extra bit of rigidity, I've brought out the old four-way tool post, with the only downside here being is I don't have a lot of tools that actually fit into it. And there we have it. All we need to do now is test it. I'll need to make up some new tool holders for some future tests, but let's quickly see how it turns some um, hot rolled steel. And I've got to say, that's pretty unbelievable. One mil depth of cut using a tool that really isn't set up for the job is a pretty good achievement. I'll be sure to get some better tools for the job and test it in the future, but I've got to say, I'm pretty happy with that. Anything over half a mil of cut is, I think, pretty good for these little machines. I hope you enjoyed this video, took away something new, and with that, see you next time. Thank you for watching.